This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists get funding, gain influence, and build strategic relationships with the stakeholders who matter most in their professional world. Reaching those goals often involves effective translation of complicated research into engaging, jargon-free communication that boils down complex topics to capture the attention of decision makers and general audiences. Interested in getting a free resource to help you do just that? Go to complexitymadeclear.com to get the 11 keys for translating complexity. That's complexitymadeclear.com to get your free infographic used by science communicators at major organizations to boil down, but not dumb down, complicated science and technical topics for key stakeholders. I am so pleased to welcome Peter Barker to the show today. Peter is founder and creative director of Orinoco Communications, a full-fledged digital communications and content creation agency with a single mission, to combine storytelling and strategy to give research the reach it deserves. Peter is a multimedia producer with more than 15 years experience creating documentaries, animations, and other forms of digital content for TV and online. Peter also presents Orinoco's Research Comms podcast, which you really should subscribe to and which we will be linking to in the show notes accompanying this episode. Before starting Orinoco Communications in 2016, Peter worked as a television producer and director, a job that took him all over the world filming everywhere from NASA bases in the United States to volcanic islands in the Pacific Ocean and religious festivals in Africa to ancient Mayan ruins in Central America. Those peripatetic days are now behind him, and he enjoys a happily sedate life with his family in Austin, Texas, where he indulges his growing obsession with all things baked. There's nothing wrong with baked goods, I can tell you that. Peter earned his BA in Modern History from the University of Oxford. Welcome to the show, Peter. It is fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm used to, accustomed to being on the other side of the microphone, so it should be an interesting experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to ask you straight away, what drew you to crafting and communicating stories? Because you have such deep experience all over the world, different media would love for you to share with listeners how it all started. Sure. Yeah. So I, I guess I've been interested in reading stories since for as long as I remember, since I was a kid, I used to love reading all kinds of books, fiction, nonfiction, whatever it was. And in the UK, we're, unfortunately, I would say we're, we're required to specialize with our education very early. So at the age of 16, you basically have to decide whether you're going to go down the route of STEM, STEM learning or, or arts and humanities. I wasn't, didn't have that much of a knack for science, so I happily put my lot in with the humanities and studies. History, English, Spanish uh, for the last two years of high school. So obviously that was a lot to do with, with stories and then went on to study history, as you mentioned, at, at university. And I think what always gripped me about that, the reason I loved history was because of the stories. I was less interested probably in the side of the kind of the economics and so on. It was always the narrative histories, le learning about the people, what motivated, what drove them. That was always what appealed. So. From there, I studied that for three years and then had to make a decision about what I wanted to do after university. As much as I enjoyed studying, I, I hadn't perhaps been as applied as I might have been if I'd wanted to carry on as an academic. I don't think my professors necessarily would have recommended it given, yeah, my sort of application at times, but I loved the work and wanted to carry on still learning about these stories and finding a way to tell them. So I went at that moment into documentary television documentaries, wanted to make history documentaries, and then 
did do some history, but ended up working across a whole range of subjects. That's where I fell in love with science for the first time. As I said, at school, it, I hadn't connected with it particularly, but I realized at that point that, that science was an absolutely fascinating subject, that there were some amazing stories to be told within that too, that it wasn't all just kind of facts and figures. And yeah, fell in love with that and then carried on working on programs about history, politics, religion, science, and so on, all had the opportunity there to just be telling some amazing stories about a wide range of interesting subjects. And then that took me up to, after about 10 years doing that, carried on that vein of storytelling when I started Orinoco Communications with the view to working directly with research organizations, helping them to tap into their own stories and work out what those stories were and how to tell them and, and engaging. Thanks for illustrating that and really bring it to life. And you made some important points, Peter, too, talking about the history, the stories, not just the facts and figures. I think you can apply that, like you suggested also to science. Some people get turned off by science because that's all they're doing is more the, the equations. And there's not it, it, the, the sort of spirit of discovery, which it sounds like you fell in love with later on. And the the relationships that all these other things going on can really enliven science in, in any subject, pointing out how that works in history uh, is, which is, is so critical. Sometimes I say to my, my kids, history is just somebody else's present, or you're living history right now. Someone's going to be reading oh, about it. We are. Yeah, sure. And it won't, but to make it interesting, it can't just be what was this battle or what was that date or something like that. So Thank you for doing what you do to really breathe life into these topics that, that more people need to know about and get involved with. You touched upon the different media, the different ways that you have developed your expertise in communications. From your perspective, how is developing communications in say the visual or the oral or the text media similar? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. I would say. My expertise is more in the visual, certainly from starting working TV documentaries and, and then into the work that I do now, which is creating more kind of short form online video content. The, the focus has been on the sort of visual side of audio visual, but uh, as you mentioned, I do have a, a, a podcast where I interview people who are doing particularly inspiring work in the field of research communication. So I now have more experience to doing the pure audio side as well. And also I do a certain amount of writing, not just script writing for the videos, but I write blogs and, and newsletters and so on about the world of research communications and so on. So I've got a kind of experience in all those areas. And I would say that whilst the way in which, I, I guess the main difference is the way in which those three sort of formats are consumed by people, podcasts personally, and I suspect it's across the board, people will often be listening to podcasts whilst they're doing something else, whether that's commuting or going for a walk or cooking or ironing or whatever it might be, that allows for a, a sort of longer way of delivering the stories and delivering the information because you're not totally focused on that one thing. Video requires more of your attention to enjoy it, to appreciate it, especially in you know, modern day, there's so much sort of uh, competition for your attention that it means that when you're solely focused on that one thing, it needs to be short. So that's why we tend to make videos online that are a couple of minutes, two to five minutes long, generally, because we know that people stop watching after that point. It's not the same for podcasts. And then text again, whether it's in the form of a book or uh, whatever it might be, it requires more of your attention. Again, you have to think more carefully about the way in which you're writing and the way in which people consume those different formats. But ultimately the, the principles are still the same in terms of creating something that's engaging, delivering a, a clear message and, and telling uh, an engaging story. So the same principles apply. I would say those would be the need to really be clear about what it is that you're communicating and to whom. So working out ahead of time, what the value is of, of what you're saying and why people would be interested in listening to it. That's going to be the same regardless of what you're doing. You perhaps have to be even more careful about that when you're doing video, because as I say, you have less time, you don't have the luxury of time. So you have to whittle it down even further, but that's one of the main things just, yeah, sort of be clear about what your message is. Lots of other principles of storytelling as well, that perhaps we can come on to, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I would say. It's the medium might be different, but the principles are ultimately all the same. Yeah, it's so true. And I'm going to ask you in the vein of storytelling, if you have any memorable stories that you can share from 
all the years that you spent in such diverse environments on different topics and different topography and all these different kind of situations that you were in. Anything that sticks out as an interesting story or a memorable story that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, there, there were loads. To be honest, that's the one I, I would say of all the things that I miss most about working in television was that opportunity just to to travel and explore. And I think nowadays, to be honest, it's different even to when I was doing, I started it, you know, 15 or so years ago was when I started out in TV. The budgets were different back then to make documentaries for sort of National Geographic and Discovery and so on. They wouldn't think twice about sending a, a crew off all over the world. Now I think uh, a lot more of it's done remotely and so on. So I realized we were in a bit of a golden age back then, but had amazing opportunities. You mentioned a couple of them in the intro places that uh, I got to visit. I'd say the first big trip that I did was actually here, coming here to Texas. First time I ever came to Texas, little did I know back then that I would end up living here but loved it from the outset and that was for a documentary that we were making about the birth of the solar system so we went to nasa johnson space center and i guess it's just the kind of the access that you sometimes got that people otherwise wouldn't have got to interesting things so we got to go down into this sort of vault in the depths of of the johnson space center and where they keep all the lunar rock that was brought back from the apollo space missions and just being shown around that, and obviously it was all, we weren't like handling it or anything. It was all kept away behind glass cases and climate control conditions and so on. But just, yeah, being that close to these sort of deeply historical artifacts from those iconic missions was, given it was one of the first things that I ever did, was a real eye-opener for what was to come. And then, yeah, many memorable trips after that. Some in America, got to travel to Ghana doing a history of Christianity, which is pretty exciting experience Ghana in West Africa. And just one day, I remember I was there just on a research trip. We were trying to find an example of a, a large scale mega church Pentecostal ceremony. And I was there on my own and, and found this place and was allowed to come and, and watch one of the services. And I was just there watching from the sideline as I don't know, thousands of people in the, being kind of whipped into a state of religious fervor, um, it was all happening at this time. And, and suddenly the bishop, I realized, was starting to say, he was like, hey, I would like to welcome from London our friend who's come here to help us worship the Lord. And then made me, ushered me on stage and I was just standing there and people were just sort of, not because of me, I would like to say, in a sort of state of ecstasy. And I was just standing there, I didn't know what to do. I just waved mildly and then went back and sat back down. But I mean, just those kind of very strange, unique experiences were, were yeah were really gripped me about doing it. And there were yeah, many more, but there were a couple of stand out. <laughs> really vivid. Both of them <laughs> are such vivid, excellent stories. I also, a lot of our listeners collaborate with colleagues internationally. So they're part of teams <clears throat> that could have scientists, you know, really all from all over the world working on a particular project and your agencies in Austin, Texas, and also in the UK. And I'd like for you to share some of the similarities or differences in working with your clients, of course, you've got clients all over in working with clients in the States and in Europe, or maybe even in other countries as well. Some of the things you've noticed that maybe you need to pay particular attention to in working with a client from a place, which isn't as much of an issue or is different when you're working with an American, for example. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. I would say my experience of working across cultures has been largely UK and US. We've done some work with European partners as well. Actually, I've worked with, done some work for an organization in Japan too. But I, yeah, my main sort of understanding is across the UK US cultural divide, which it is there for sure. I would say um, there are differences in the way people work in the UK and the US. The work ethic in America is pretty fierce, very strong, which is great but you have to get used to the uh, long hours and lack of holidays that people have over here compared to the UK. But in terms of, in terms of the practice, I would say I was expecting, so I moved, actually maybe it'd be helpful to give a bit of background as to why I'm in the States in the mm -hmm. first place. I'd lived in London all my life. So 30 odd years, ended up meeting my now wife over there in London, who's from Texas and we got married, lived in London for five years together, but always spoke about coming over to, to Texas to spend some time and yeah, just seemed like a really exciting opportunity. Loved Texas from the time I'd been here. So we came and did that at the end of 2019. 
the start of 2020. So I was, didn't know what was about to unfold at the time. Okay. It was a challenging moment, I think, in many ways to be starting a new branch of my business in a new country, just as the pandemic hit and lockdown. But yeah, I would say one of the things that has been really refreshing was based on that, how difficult it was to suddenly go and network and all the things that you really want to be doing when you're trying to introduce yourself to a new market. It would have been a lot harder if Americans hadn't, generally in Texans, I suppose specifically, because that's where most of the work that I've been doing weren't as welcoming and hospitable and, and helpful and friendly as they are. Um, not to say that Brits are, are, are the opposite, but I would say that's been something I've been really been impressed by is how open to, yeah, how generous people are with their time and their contacts and so on here and how willing they are just to get on a call and have a chat, regardless of whether it feels like anything's going to come out of it mm -hmm. uh, for them. has been great and has been absolutely essential, especially during this time. Yeah, that's one thing, but by and large, I think because of the, the nature of the people that I work with and for who are often academics, scientists, just kind of researchers in general, research communicators, uh, probably quite a similar bunch, regardless of where you are in the world. There are definitely similarities, very mission driven people used to a collaborating across international boundaries anyway. So I, I, I suspect generally more open-minded people than perhaps you get in, in other sectors. So yeah, the differences haven't been as stark as they might've been probably if I worked in, if it was just in sort of a, more of a corporate sphere or something, I think that yeah, scientists around the world definitely share some similarities in terms of approach and so on. So yeah, it's been fantastic. Wonderful. I want to touch upon this because earlier in our discussion, you mentioned Spanish and you had studied there. You have been and done work in Spanish speaking countries earlier in your career, also a Londoner and then in Texas. So there's a certain degree of translation that happens building on what we're talking about with different cultures. And I wonder given your expertise in research communications, which can involve translation of these technical topics, as we know, into things that are accurate and accessible to lay people, how maybe your language or bicultural nature of your firm may help you sometimes when you're taking on these complicated, complex situations and then having to translate them while still preserving the accuracy of what what the underlying research says. I guess all life experiences feed into the way you do stuff to a certain extent. And I have been fortunate to yeah, have had this opportunity to travel with work originally and then to live in another country. I think this last couple of years, I must admit, has been incredibly formative. If anybody has the opportunity to spend a chunk of time away from the place they've grown up, I would just sort of wholeheartedly encourage them to do it because it's been an amazing experience. I think, as I said, Culturally, Texas and, and London are quite different in many respects. It's been a really interesting time to be around people who have different sort of perspectives on the world and on the way things are. I think that can only ever, if you approach it in the right way, can only ever make you more open-minded, which hopefully, you know, I think that helps with translation in the sense that perhaps it's sort of increases your empathy. And I think that's an important part of communication, communicating science is to see where your audience are coming from and get a sense of their values and so on. So I think it's been helpful in that regard, but from a translation point of view, probably more useful than the kind of cross-cultural side of things has been probably the fact that, especially when it comes to communicating science is that my background isn't in science, as I said, at all, gave it up as early as I could and then regretted it later, but still my background isn't a scientific one. So working in documentaries was a great training ground for just being thrown into a subject you knew nothing about perhaps, and then very quickly having to get up to speed with it, learn enough that you could then tell a story about it and explain it and, and communicate it in a way that people would find engaging. So in a way it's, yeah, less the, the international boundaries, I think that has influenced the way I do communications now and more perhaps that kind of cross-discipline uh, need to quickly understand a subject and to be able to communicate it. And that's why, in a way, with Orinoco, there have been moments where I've been tempted to focus 
most of the work we do is science. So I guess there have been opportunities where I could have just said, okay, well, let's just do science and forget the humanities and social sciences and so on in order to be even more niche. But actually recently I've been thinking more that kind of interdisciplinarity is a niche in itself. And it's been so beneficial because there's so many crossovers, especially now where uh, you can't really think about climate change without thinking about the social impacts. You can't think, of, you know, and even religious, just everything, the more you look into these scenarios, the more you realize everything overlaps, basically. I think keeping that broad range helps me translate from one subject to the other. Makes a lot of sense. Seeing those ways to touch on people's values and beliefs, as you suggested, as you said, as we wrap up, Peter, we started with storytelling and your fascination with that, your focus on that, your expertise in that. And a lot of times listeners here, you really should include storytelling in your presentations or there's a, a poster session that you should, you know, use storytelling, but they're not really told how or what makes a good story. And I'm wondering if you could share as we wrap up, maybe just one thing that listeners could take away from our conversation that they could implement right away to, to make themselves better storytellers. There are obviously loads of considerations uh, when it comes to trying to tell an interesting story. But for me, one of the things that I've learned over time is it's less about the kind of broadcast aspect of, of storytelling, which is often people thinking, okay, how am I going to tell the story? It's more sort of what leads into telling a good story and knowing how to do that. And for me, the, the big thing is learning probably how to listen. If you are, you know, if, if you're telling a story by interviewing somebody, for example, there's that one aspect of just making sure that you're listening to what they're saying. It seems obvious, but sometimes we're so keen to get our, get our questions in that uh, we, we sort of cut people off, but getting accustomed to doing lots of documentary interviews over time, you really get trained to learn about the, the power of silence. If somebody stops talking, don't try and fill that gap, just keep listening. And often they'll fill it in a much more interesting way than you were going to. Yeah. Let those silent moments speak. But I think even more important than that is just listening to your audience. So that's why it's so important to really know who you're talking to. There's always a temptation, I think, to, to to want to speak to everybody. So when clients, organizations come to us and say, Hey, we want an animation and we ask them who it's for, often they'll say it, it's principally going to be focused at school children, but at the same time, we want other members of the public to find it interesting too. And of course the press, and then suddenly the list goes on and on of how many different people that they want to, to target. Whereas we're always trying to encourage people to really refine who you're talking to or trying to communicate with, because that's so important. And as part of that listening to them, having an opportunity to better understand what they care about, what their values are, uh, what their likes, dislikes, fears, and so on. Uh, the better you understand the people that you're trying to talk to, the better you can craft a message that's going to resonate with them. Yeah. Listening is the, is the key. Great advice. And most people don't think about that. Like you said, to be a better storyteller, I need to be a better listener. Don't I just have to use these words and figure out this message and things like that. So important. And I, I like the example that you also gave Peter, when you were interviewing as part of documentary filmmaking, interviewing subjects and, and not feeling the silence and, and maybe that person actually puts in more in interesting information. It just reminds me of uh, a, a famous interviewer here for many years who passed away probably about a decade ago. He was the host of a major political show here. So he was always interviewing high-powered politicians, including presidents and others. His name was Tim Russert, and the show was Meet the Press. And uh, he talked about the, listen for the seams in a response, the S-E-A-M-S, -S, where they're stop with one topic and then stop talking. And if you don't interrupt them, the, the, they'll go from that to what's connected to it that could be even more Interesting. So I love your answer to that. I know it's going to be helpful for listeners. Great. Thank you so much. Peter Barker, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us uh, and tell us about Orinoco Communications and all the work you're doing. Of course, your podcast, which is going to be linked to in the show notes. I'd recommend everyone take a listen to that. And listeners, I appreciate you being along with us for this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. 
Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.